So what I have for you here is a unit circle. And just to kind of remember the definitions of sine, cosine, and tangent, I'm at the top of the page here. We know that sine of theta is y over r. We know cosine theta is x over r. And we know tangent theta is y over x. And that, remember, the context was you had an angle that went out to a point x comma y. And we draw a line segment from the origin to that point. And this is the angle theta that we're talking about. So what we're doing is just kind of making it more specific. I'm going to say, well, since the figure that connects all points that have the same distance from the origin is a circle, I'm going to talk about the circle whose radius is 1. And that circle is the unit circle. And when r is 1, this stuff simplifies. Right here, for example, if r is 1, I just have y equals sine theta. And if r equals 1, I have x equals cosine theta. So there's your definitions there. So that means any point on the unit circle is basically the cosine of an angle for the x-coordinate and the sine of the angle for the y-coordinate. So I have a lot of things labeled here on this unit circle, and I just want to talk about a couple things here too. So in blue, I have the angle in radians, and you notice here, 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 and here that the angle is listed in degrees, and that is to show the correspondence between the angle in degrees and the angle in radians. So just as an example, we already know that sine of 60 degrees is root 3 over 2. Well, that also means that the sine of pi over 3, remember 60 degrees is pi over 3 in radians, right, is root 3 over 2. We're going to be converting everything we know over to radians because radians are real numbers. They're not some fictitious, contrived scale to measure an angle. And we've already seen the correspondence between radians and degrees earlier. So that's what we're dealing with here. Okay, so in blue, you see the angle in radians. The coordinates we already know are the cosine and sine of the corresponding angle. So what this is telling me right here is that cosine of pi over 3 is a half, and the sine of pi over 3 is root 3 over 2, just as an example, okay? And the numbers that I have sitting out here are the ratios y over x. And why is y over x important? Remember, that's the tangent of the angle. So we're going to take this time to analyze sine, cosine, and eventually tangent, okay? So looking at this table right here, this is a table that maps x talking about x as the angle and sine of x as the output. So this is kind of a y equals sine of x or an f of x equals sine of x. Because we want to know as a function, what does the sine do? Okay, so I've already filled in the values. And remember, if I'm looking at the sine, I'm looking at the y coordinate of each point. So as we go around the ring here, y coordinate is 0, 1 half, root 2 over 2, root 3 over 2, 1, and so on and so on. So there are the points. Now, if we plot those points and connect the dots, I'm just going to come down here. That's the graph that we get. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, you notice I left a bunch of things out here. This is really the y-axis here. Okay. And... At 0, we have 0. At pi over 2, we're at 1. At pi, we're at 0, and so on and so on. And you might remember that if you take the sine of any, you know, we know that two angles that are coterminal are, you know, two pi units apart. If you take any trig function of an angle that's coterminal, you get the same ratio because it lands at the same point on the circle as well. Coming back up here to the unit circle, we can see that. What if I wanted, you know, the cosine of... Uh, 405 degrees. Well, that would be around and then end up here. So I know already that I'm going to end up at the same point, which means cosine of 40, 405 is the same as cosine of 45, or rather sine of 405 is the same as 405. So this graph repeats itself. So remember that sine of theta plus 2 pi is the same as sine of theta, and remember that the magic word there is that because the angles are coterminal to each other, okay? So that means that when we go to graph just the sine of the angle, 
as the angle increases and increases, it's going to repeat itself every two pi radians, which is this whole idea of what a period is. Okay, so this is what the graph of sine of x looks like. Just notice, maximum point here at 1, minimum point here at negative 1, keeps bouncing back and forth. At pi over 2, it hits its max. At 3 pi over 2, it hits its min. So it starts at 0, and we know it's going to start over again at 2 pi. In the middle of those two x-intercepts is another x-intercept. In between the first two x-intercepts is the max. In between the last two intercepts is the min. So these are the key pieces of the graph of sine that we have to understand. And cosine is going to be very similar to this, as we're going to see. Now, if we know what the graph of sine of x looks like, we should know what the graph of 3 sine of x looks like. I'm basically taking the original y values in this first graph, and I'm multiplying them by 3. Another word I can use there is that I'm amplifying it by 3. So if at x equals 0, you know, there's my x-axis here. I know I'm still at 0 because 0 times 3 is 0. But if my y value was 1 before, now I'm multiplying that y value by 3. I'm up here at 3. At pi, I'm still at 0 because, again, 3 times 0 is 0. At 3 pi over 2, I'm down here at negative 3 because, again, I'm multiplying that original negative 1 by 3, and then I'm back. And then I'm repeating again. So here is what the graph of 3 sine of x looks like in comparison to just regular sine of x. So the question is, what does that number out in front of the sine graph do? So I want to look at this. This 3 here means that this max value is 3, and that min value is negative 3. Hmm, I wonder if that has any special significance. Let's talk about it after our next example here. y equals 1 half sine of x. Now again, regular sine of x, if you want to call it that, regular sine of x peaked out at 1. Now, if I multiply it by a half, I'm only going to peak out at a half. So that means I'm going to be there. And then I'm going to, so I'm starting at zero, going up to a half, coming down to zero, going down to negative a half, and so on. And it keeps repeating. So yeah, I could take up the whole grid, but I think we get the idea. There's two periods of one half sine of x. And what you notice is one half is... So plus or minus one half is the min or the max. Now, what if we multiply the outside by negative two? Well, here's another interesting thing. So, looking at that, if I multiply zero by negative two, I still have zero. Now, if it was one to begin with, it is now negative two, which means I'm down here, right? If it was zero to begin with, I'm still zero. But if I was negative one to begin with, just like the original graph of sine, I suggest you look back up. That means I'm now at positive 2 and then back. So what does that look like? Well, you notice it's kind of upside down. And you might remember that from, from your algebra class. If you know the, the graph of y equals f of x looks like, putting a negative in front of f of x is going to flip the graph across the x-axis. So this is nothing new to us, really. Now I'm just going to graph another period of this because we want to get the full effect of this. There's my graph of y equals negative 2 sine x. And, of course, there is another part over here as well. And there we have it. Okay. So let's just summarize. If I'm looking at the graph of y equals a sine of x, that quantity, absolute value of a, is called the amplitude. So amplitude itself has to be a positive number. Amplitude tells you how far is it away from the center, which is zero, to either the highest point or the lowest point, okay? So this one would have an amplitude of two because A is negative two, okay? This one up here would have an amplitude of one half. And this one here would have an amplitude of three, okay? So... If the absolute value of A, if the amplitude is greater than 1, then the graph of the basic sine curve, I'm going to call it stretches. And we'll call it stretches vertically. Because that's what happened, right? With 3 sine of x and negative 2 sine of x, the graph stretched. 
And if A is less than one, the graph of the basic sine curve as well will say shrinks vertically. And if A is less than zero, notice there's no absolute value there, then the graph of the basic sine curve reflects across the x-axis. Okay, so that's all we have for the sine curve right now. This will develop as we go. So thank you for watching.